Okay. Seems like uh, we're ready to begin this session. So um, welcome everyone to our session on Migration with Dignity, Perspectives on Climate Change and Human Mobility. Um, just a reminder that this session is being recorded um, for, for your general awareness. Uh, my name is Shana McLean. I work for NASA's Earth Sciences Division on issues relating to partnerships, risk reduction, resilience. I also work with the Environmental Law Institute on issues relating to migration, displacement, conflict, and peace. I'm going to be leading all of us through the next uh, 90 minutes of this session, um, but we're really happy to have all of you with us today. Um, as a brief run of show, uh, we're going to um, I'm going to briefly introduce um, each one of our remarkable panelist speakers, um, and they'll be presenting in the order that I introduce them. And then following their talk, we'll move directly into the Q&A session um, for um, our event today. And then in the meantime, as you have any questions for any of our panelists, um, please do add them to the chat box and we'll cover them as we get to the Q&A. So let's go ahead now and meet each of our speakers. Uh, we're joined first by Carl Brook, who is the Director of International Programs at the Environmental Law Institute. He's the founding president of the Environmental Peace Building Association, and his work focuses on environmental peace building, environmental governance, adaptation, and environmental emergencies. Monica Iyer is a human rights officer at the United Nations Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, where she works on issues related to migration, the environment and climate change, and coordinates a project on climate-related migration in the Sahel. Within OHCHR, she's also supported the mandates of the Working Group on Discrimination Against Women and the Independent Expert on Human Rights and International Solidarity. Susan Martin is the Donald G. Herzberger Professor Emerita of International Migration in the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. She was the founder of the Institute for the Study of International Migration. She currently serves as chair of the thematic working group on environmental change and migration at the World Bank's Knowledge Platform on Migration and Development. And prior to coming to Georgetown, she was the executive director of the U.S. Commission on Immigration Reform. Brian Kelly is the head of the Community Stabilization Unit for the International Organization of Migration based in Washington, DC, but he's currently deployed to the Tigray region of Ethiopia. So we're really hoping that his, uh, his uh, internet holds stable during our event today. Um, he's been with IOM since 2000 and has worked in a number of places, including the Balkans, Afghanistan, and Indonesia, Nepal, and more. Um, where he specializes in humanitarian operations, community stabilization, peace building, reintegration, and the coordination of relief and recovery planning. And finally, acting as a discussant to our session today, and who probably doesn't need further introduction just simply because she's had such a wonderful footprint on the overarching conference in regard to her work on dignity rights, we have Erin Daly, who is a professor of law at Delaware Law School, She's also the director of the Global Network for Human Rights and the Environment and the executive director of Dignity Rights International. So welcome to our speakers. We look forward to hearing from all of you today and also learning from you. Um, with that, let's turn the floor over to Carl Brook, who'll be again dis by discussing the framework for migration with dignity. Um, Carl, the floor is yours. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Um, I'm delighted to be able to share some work that we have been developing in partnership with uh, Dignity Rights International and the Dignity Rights Project at the University of Delaware with IOM and with the support of the Sasakawa Peace Foundation and the Ocean Policy Research Institute. Currently we see hundreds of millions of people who are in motion. Um, it's estimated that more than 258 million people are international migrants. Um, there is substantial internal migration. A wide range of people for a wide range of reasons, often multiple reasons for any particular person. 
We expect that climate change will both will drive both internal and international migration. The World Bank projects that if uh, nothing is done, there will be more than 140 million internal migrants by 2050 in 30 years due to climate change. A lot of this is due to disasters, mostly weather related, uh, droughts, flooding, storms, sea level rise, heat waves. And there's been a question of what, how do we think about the people who are compelled to move, whether it's uh, um, for food, for um, because they can't provide for themselves, what, 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 where their house is being flooded by sea level rise or storms. Um, and uh, people have argued for uh, recognition of climate refugees. Uh, there are many difficulties uh, with this formulation. Part of it is uh, because there are often many reasons for migration. Uh, we've looked at uh, um, migration of Pacific Islanders to the U.S. And the, the top reason for most of them coming, including from low-lying states like the Marshall Islands and uh, um, outlying islands in Federated States of Micronesia, is education, jobs, healthcare, family. If you ask, if you keep asking climate change, it's in there, but it's not usually the leading reason. And so how do we think about these people who will, will have to move? They are moving. Climate change is part of that but it's not the reason that is compelling them to move today. Secondly, and maybe more problematic from a legal perspective is that international refugee law generally requires persecution in order to uh, somebody as a refugee. Um, and it's unlikely, uh, at least in a number of our opinions, that we will have an effective overarching new treaty covering climate refugees anytime soon. Um, we've also seen that uh, uh, um, with the recent uh, Human Rights Commission case that uh, people who move early, knowing that they will have to move because of climate change, but if you move too early, that's, that doesn't give you the protections because there are still other things that could be done. And so the, 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 there are problems with uh, timing. Um, and there's also logistical problems. If you wait until people have to move, then you have thousands or hundreds of thousands of people that you have to absorb very quickly. And they've had their assets wiped out. Um, they're, they're just fleeing with whatever they can carry. Uh, the, so is there another way of thinking about how these people move and what society can do. Former Kiribati president Anote Tong noted that there is no dignity in being a refugee. And he coined the term migration with dignity as a way to empower people to have control over whether they migrate, when they migrate, how they migrate, and to have the skills and assets so that they can provide a life of dignity for themselves and their families. And interestingly, he wasn't saying that countries have to let us in. He wasn't saying countries have to pay us. He was saying, we want to build up our skills. We want to educate our people so that they can have uh, um, educational and vocational qualifications. Um, and create buying land, for example, in Fiji, so that they can maintain cultural and personal identities. And it's important also that his framing looks at things that can be done before migration, during migration, and after migration. So this is the basic framework. And people have talked about this, they've cited to it. But what does it really mean when you, know, you start unpacking it? What does it mean? Where's the legal basis? Well, partnered among the different institutions, uh, the Dignity Rights Initiative has, they are the global experts on dignity rights. 
it's not necessarily related to migration. It's about life and being a human being. IOM knows migration inside and out. And we were, as, as a partner, we were able to look at international human rights law, international migration law, comparative constitutional law, um, which is often a source of dignity rights to come up with the following framework. And we have six core elements here. The freedom of movement, the right to be secure, the right of equality, rights to a basic quality of life, rights to access services and civil and political rights. And I think it's interesting to note that each of these has a number of elements, uh, freedom of movement. This is the freedom to leave the country of origin, freedom to return, um, freedom of movement within the country of origin. So if, if you have uh, internal migration and yes, admission to a foreign country. The right to be secure is freedom from sexual, from human trafficking, from arbitrary and abusive detention. Right of equality is fundamentally the right of non-discrimination, that all people are equal under the law and with opportunities for upward mobility. The quality of life related rights have to do with employment, being able to provide for themselves and not being a ward of the state, being able to access housing, to have food, access to services such as healthcare, education, utilities, legal services and uh, civil and political rights, such as identity, religion, language, free speech. And for the lawyers uh, in the crowd, you'll see that yeah, these, these don't look too original. Uh, they, these are well-established under uh, both um, international human rights law, uh, under widespread under constitutional law. And that's part of what we think is so exciting about this, that much of these provisions all already exist, but we need to look at them in the context of migration. We need to look at them in a, in a holistic manner. And we need to do this not only from a generic person perspective, we do need to also have a gender lens here. So uh, one thing we see in, um, in a number of instances are stories of uh, women, in order to get their paperwork processed, they are, uh, they are sexually coerced. Um, right to be secure, freedom from sexual violence, rights of equality, including non-discrimination based on gender, um, rights to access to services such as reproductive services, and identity related to gender. And I want to be clear, gender is not just women. Gender has a, has a range of identities here. And in a lot of countries, this may not be recognized um, or may be persecuted, at least culturally, if not uh, de jure. I will also note that the rights to a basic quality of life are tethered to, they're linked to a lot of the other rights of non-discrimination, access to services, and rights to be secure. A few uh, broad observations about the framework. First of all, many elements of the Migration with Dignity framework that we are positing already exist under both international law and national law. Yes, there are challenges with implementation, but they're already on the books, often at a very high level, for example, through Secondly, the Migration with Dignity Framework provides a baseline, provides a conceptual framework by which countries and others can evaluate particular migration pathways to identify what, what, what are the protections that exist and where are their gaps. And we have developed an evaluation methodology to assist people in this analysis. Third, I think this is where there's particular strength in this. Due to the strong human rights and comparative constitutional law foundation, it's broadly applicable. It applies to all people by nature of their humanity. It applies to internal and international migration. Um, it does not require that somebody is persecuted. Climate change 
with its expectation to increase uh, the drivers of migration, it will give urgency to the migration with dignity framework. The first thing that I wanted to say is that this framework looks across the migration cycle. So often issues of climate migration focus specifically on entry. Where are they going to go? Who's going to accept th this group of people or these individuals? Instead, we're looking you know, from preparation, what, what's happening internally in a country, what sort of educational and skills opportunities are there, pre-departure uh, briefings, uh, protection during transit, yes, entry, but, and then substantially, what happens to people after they migrate and can they return? With that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and recognize the other individuals who have uh, been instrumental in framing this uh, framework. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carl. Uh, Monica, we'll now turn it over to you. Thanks, Shannon. Thanks to the organizers of this great symposium and everyone who's involved in organizing this panel for inviting the Office of the High Commissioner to take part. We're uh, very happy to be included in this conversation. I want to start with a simple reminder that the human rights contained in the International Bill of Human Rights are guaranteed to everyone, including all migrants, and aren't dependent on possession of any particular immigration status. Um, it's clear by now that anthropogenic climate change has enormous human rights effects across the world. Indeed, our High Commissioner has characterized it as the greatest human rights threat that we've ever faced. This threat gives rise to specific human rights obligations, including with regard to those who are on the move for reasons that can be linked to climate change. Given these obligations, states should indeed facilitate safe and regular migration and address the specific human rights protection needs of all migrants. Consistent with their international human rights commitments, they should ensure that migrants have access to, among others, food, water, and sanitation, to health, education, and social services at all stages of the migration journey. They should take concrete steps to eliminate and ensure accountability for any violations or abuse. And they should enact and implement migration laws and policies that safeguard the principles of non refoulement and the prohibition of collective expulsion, as well as the rights to liberty, personal integrity, and family life and unity. It's particularly important to note that many people on the move today, including those who may be moving wholly or in part of, as a result of the slow or sudden onset effects of climate change, as Carl has mentioned, may fall outside of legal protection provided by the refugee regime, but they're nonetheless persons in need of specific human rights protection interventions. Because of this, OHCHR, working with other UN entities, has developed a set of principles and guidelines on the human rights protection of migrants in vulnerable situations. The principles and guidelines recognize that migrants may face situations of vulnerability because of the circumstances in which they travel or the conditions they face in countries of origin, transit, or destination, as well as because of personal characteristics. The guidance emphasizes the need for a wide range of human rights protections for people on the move, including avenues for admission and stay based on international human rights law obligations, as well as access to necessary human rights protections and services throughout their migration journeys. It's essential to recognize that moving in order to avoid the negative human rights impacts of climate change is itself a human right. All persons have the rights to leave any country and to move freely and choose one's place of residence within a country once lawfully present. In fulfilling their human rights obligations, states should facilitate such movement, and they should also take particular measures to address the needs and the situations of vulnerability faced by those who may be unable to move. We must be aware that in the context of climate change and environmental degradation, there are particular risks of migrants being caught in situations of limit but they do not possess status in the country in which they are located, but where return to their home country is rendered impossible. 
in such situations, human rights, humanitarian, and other considerations relevant to migrants in situations of vulnerability can establish a basis for their admission and stay. Establishing pathways for migrants compelled to move due to slow and sudden onset disasters will enable such migrants to claim regular admission and or stay on these grounds through a rules-based and well-grounded procedure that can be initiated prior, upon, or after arrival in a country of destination. State human rights obligations also require them to address the adverse drivers of human mobility, the factors that would compel people to leave their homes when they would otherwise prefer to stay. In the context of climate change, this means mitigating climate effects by taking urgent, ambitious action to limit global temperature rise. As a number of courts have recently recognized, in order to ensure intergenerational equity and protect the human rights of future generations, these actions need to be taken now and not promised for the future. Of course, climate change effects on human mobility are already being felt around the world and will continue to be felt into the future, no matter how urgently or ambitiously we work to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. Human rights law, including the rights to life, to health, and to an adequate standard of living, gives rise to a requirement that states take adequate adaptation measures to plan and prepare for the adverse effects of climate change and build resilience. Such measure, measures should seek to protect rights, strengthen, strengthen social protection systems, reduce disaster risk and exposure, and increase adaptive capacity. Access to justice, accountability, and effective remedies are also essential human rights, and states must provide effective mechanisms to prevent and redress human rights harms and loss and damage resulting from the adverse effects of climate change and from climate change mitigation and adaptation. They should make specific efforts to make such mechanisms available to migrants and to ensure that these principles are reflected throughout migration policy and procedures. No state can do all of this on its own. Both climate change and climate change related human mobility are global and cross-border phenomena that compel global cross-border and collective and collaborative action. International cooperation for the respect, protection and fulfillment of human rights is required by the International Co Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights and necessary for realizing the aims and purposes of the UN Charter. Commitments to such cooperation are are also contained in the Paris Agreement, in the Global Compacts for Migration and for Refugees, in the Nansen Initiative, and in numerous other international agreements and policies. This requires adequate climate finance and development assistance specifically targeted at ensuring the protection of the human rights of migrants, as well as enactment and implementation of regional, multilateral, and bilateral policies and programs. Finally, and possibly most importantly, International human rights law guarantees the right to meaningful and informed participation in the affected individuals and communities. Frameworks, programs, and policy choices all should be guided by the voices, preferences, and leadership of those who bear the human rights risk. For all decisions or actions, including those that impact Indigenous peoples' rights, states must obtain their free, prior, and informed consent in accordance with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Consultation with migrants and with others affected cannot be a mere tick box, tick box exercise. Genuine consultation, including efforts to overcome participation barriers, is a necessity not only for realizing human rights obligations, but also for ensuring effectiveness. Thank you again for having me, and I'm looking forward to the rest of our discussion. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Monica. Um, Susan, over to you. Thank you. Let me just uh, share my screen if I can find it. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for this invitation. I, I find the concept of migration and dignity to be extremely useful in thinking through what needs to be done in the context of, um, of climate change, but not just climate change, also um, other environmental drivers of migration, because not every um, environmental impact is related to uh, climate change, but there are very similar issues that arise um, for people who are caught in those situations. Um, as uh, many of you uh, all certainly know, um, the inter um, 
Governmental Panel on Climate Change in their fifth assessment report, um, where it was pretty definitive that climate change will be increasing the displacement of people. Um, they held that extreme weather events would provide the most direct pathway, and we're, of course, already seeing this. But they mentioned that, uh, noted that in the longer term, it's the slow onset processes, sea level rise, coastal erosion, and particularly loss of agricultural productivity, which will have a significant, the most significant impact on migration flows. Um, and I think it's in understanding that there are multiple drivers within the driver of climate change that we need to be thinking about as we look at what type of migration um, may occur and with what implications. Um, so, in, sorry, my, my arrows disappeared um, or went into the wrong places. Um, but in thinking about the nexus between um, my migration and dignity um, and climate change, um, I wanna really focus on the Cancun adaptation framework and the concept of adaptation and also uh, resilience building um, that is linked to sustainable development. Um, mobility patterns will differ depending on the scenario that the IPCC set out. Um, drought and rising sea levels are more likely to produce gradual migration um, with people leaving over a period of time, probably at the um, individual and household level, not necessarily the community level, although there may be situations in which um, planned relocation, which is a another part of the adaptation framework will be required. Um, but acute natural hazards um, and the disasters that accompany them, um, especially when linked to conflict, will, most, will lead to emergency displacement. And that's the third form of movement that the Cancun framework refers to. So migration, including anticipatory movements, um, planned relocation for people who are needing some assistance in being able to relocate because the conditions no longer allow them to stay where they are, and displacement um, in the case of acute um, hazards and, and conflict. Um, almost all of the research that's been conducted over the last number of years um, indicate that internal movements are likely to be much more prevalent than long distance international movements. Um, Carl mentioned the uh, World Bank report, I'm very much involved in it. The 140 million is actually just for um, Sub-Saharan Africa, Central America and South Asia. Um, the part two of the report will be coming out uh, later this year and that will now have global um, estimates as to uh, what is forecast to be the, uh, the future migration. It also just deals with the slow onset processes. It doesn't um, refer to displacement. So it's a conservative estimate. Um, and yet in many ways, it's a reassuring estimate because those numbers given the scale of migration today, particularly internal migration, but also international, um, are not as scary as one might think because those levels actually are manageable and there are things that can be done. It's not an inevitability um, as, the, um, for, as the Grantsville report from the bank um, makes very clear. Um, we also believe that trap populations may be most vulnerable um, to the impacts of, um, of climate change. So the people who are involuntarily immobile um, who can't get to safety. Um, and that's where planned relocation comes in. Unfortunately, the history of planned resettlement or relocation um, is not a, a pretty one. Um, rather, it's a situation where people are often worse off after having been relocated than they were prior to movement. Um, and so I'll get back to this, a lot more needs to be done in that area. Um, and as also Carl mentioned, migration is seldom um, affected by one cause. Um, so the forms of movement are likely to be very complex and not fit neat boxes that we might want to put them in. Um, 
It's also the types of movement, the extent to which people will need to move or are trapped is going to be very much determined by um, usually household resilience and coping capacity. And there are a number of factors that affect affect people's resilience um, and adaptation. Um, Their financial capital issues, do they have sustainable livelihood options, where they are, where they might go, Um, is there cultivatable and habitable land for those who um, are in rural areas or be moving to rural areas, do they have assets that they can call upon um, in order to be able to uh, sustain themselves over time. Do they have human capital? Can Carl mention that? Do they have education and skills? Um, what about their overall health and well being, uh, including their mental health and emotional uh, support systems? Um, which leads to the third thing do they have social networks um, to help them where they are or to support out migration to cities or other countries where they might find employment um, and safety? So, in this sense, um, posit that there's a dual relationship between adaptation, resilience building on one hand, and mobility, um, meaning all of the different forms of movement I mentioned. Um, There are adaptation strategies that have the potential to reduce immigration pressures, um, modifying agricultural and fishing practices so people can deal with um, drought resistant, you know, having drought resistant um, seeds would be an obvious thing in cases of more pro, pro, um, protracted drought. Um, how pastoral lands are managed um, so that people who rely on, on, um, on, uh, on having herds of animals are able to get the um, kind of water and food that those animals need. Um, And very importantly, the disaster risk reduction um, programs under the Sendai framework um, that allow people to manage the risk better um, as a result that results from natural hazards. Uh, But we also need to think of mobility strategies as a part of the broader tool kit that allows for adaptation and resilience. Um, So anticipatory migration as a risk management strategy um, is an important issue here. Um, Can people find avenues by which they can move internally or or cross borders if necessary to manage the risk presented by the slow onset processes that are underway? Um, Relocation of at-risk populations so that they're not trapped in place. Um, And relocating them to places where they have greater opportunities. And then also tapping the migrants and diasporas as resources to support mitigation and adaptation strategies, um, either through their financial remittances back to families and communities, or the social remittances that migrants send back, which are ideas and strategies for um, for doing things better than have traditionally been done um, or allowing traditional pat, uh, practices to um, help people to cope in the longer term. Now, there are a lot of policy challenges um, to getting to this point where we have a um, really holistic view of adaptation and, and resilience. Um, and some of them have already been mentioned. There are a lack of clear standards and accountability um, mechanisms to address all of the very complex forms of human mobility. Uh, we have more um, in the way of refugee law and to, in cases in which people are denied assistance, um, that is absolutely life-threatening because they are um, a, an ethnic minority, religious minority, or um, have different political views, um, then they may in fact be refugees. um, And we can deal fairly well with that population, although certainly not perfectly. Um, But in the vast majority of cases, there won't be persecution involved. Um, Governments will actually be trying to help people who are affected by climate change. They're not trying to persecute them. Um, and um, the refugee systems aren't going to work. And there's some progress um, with regard to the guiding principles on internal displacement, but again, it deals with displacement. 
um, and the African Union Convention on Internal Displacement. Um, but there's very little in the way of international law and actually not that much in the way of national law in many countries to deal with other forms of internal mobility, whether they're planned relocation or anticipatory migration. People are likely to end up in slums and urban areas with few resources and ability to cope. Um, and then international mobility, there are very few um, legal frameworks or even policy frameworks, except in the very limited um, context of temporary protection, um, as the US has and other countries have, um, to defer removal of people who um, are um, would face life-threatening situations if returned prematurely. Um, and although I think I, I, Chris, love the concept of increasing freedom of movement um, as a major way of dealing with this issue, um, frankly, most most international law and government and national law does not allow freedom of movement, except under very, very specific, usually economic um, migration uh, or trade frameworks. Um, and so although people have the right to leave their country, they don't necessarily have a right to enter another country um, in the way that perhaps migration with dignity would allow, um, but is, is not really a part of these um, frameworks in the way one might want it. Um, and then there's um, inadequate integration of mobility into the planning and financing mechanisms for supporting adaptation and um, building resilience. Um, it's there um, and uh, we may hear a little bit more about it in terms of, of some things that IOM is doing, um, but it's not um, a, a consistent pattern. Um, so where are we now? Certainly better than we were 10 years ago, um, 10 plus years ago, when the Cancun Adaptation Framework developed. Um, there's more recognition and understanding of um, climate-related mobility um, and what needs to be done. But we're not nearly where we need to be. Um, there's no non refoulement or non-forcible return norm for those whose lives would be threatened if they had to go back home prematurely wherever. Um, there's no binding law or non-binding guiding principles um, with regard to cross-border movements, although there is a little bit more in terms of internal movements. Um, there's no clear institutional home for addressing climate-induced mobility. I'm working on a, on a paper right now with um, Alex Zelenikov, who used to be the Deputy High Commissioner for Refugees, um, and we've ne we found about six different silos in which there are multiple institutions that are working on this issue, um, but no clear home for it um, to pull it all together. Um, there's not been enough attention to migration as an adaptation strategy. Most of the attention is on loss and damage related to displacement. Um, and so that leaves a major gap. Um, and little research or advocacy around planned relocation, although the, this is already taking place and often unsuccessfully. So prospects for the future, having said all this, I'm cautiously optimistic. Um, I think that um, displacement certainly is on the agenda of multiple organizations and platforms both inside and outside of the UN, uh, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change Task Force, um, both IOM and UNHCR are taking this issue seriously. The high-level panel on internally displaced persons that just released, um, it's just releasing its report, um, has looked at, um, at climate induced displacement. Um, and the platform disaster displacement, a state-led process, um, has been supporting a lot of additional work and capacity building. But as I said before, it's migration and adaptation that needs greater attention. That's where the numbers are going to be. Um, and that's where the least capacity is. Um, a step forward with the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration that does talk about migration as adaptation and uh, needs to be fully implemented. Um, there is also the need to identify what are the safe and orderly means by which people can migrate in dignity, not in distress. Um, and there are things in terms of creative use of existing policies, whether it's labor migration, 
or others that can be um, shared and implemented more broadly. Uh, but in many cases, there will need to be um, new, whether it's humanitarian parole programs or admissions programs, complementary protection for migrants in anticipation of worsening conditions. Um, so more work needs to be done there, um, but there are ideas out there. Um, and then increasing people's resilience so they can make an informed decision. Um, this is where we can't talk about migration as dignity without talking about sustainable development um, and the implementation of the sustainable development goals, um, because that will reduce pressures for migration, but give, also give people the ability to migrate with dignity. Um, and then improving planned relocation programs um, so that we can ensure that people have a say in whether they need to move, when, how, where they will move, um, and do it through a very structured um, process in which they have an input um, in decisions that will affect their lives. Um, and uh, I will stop there. Susan, thank you so much. You've given us a lot to think about. Um, let's turn it over to Brian now, Brian Kelly. Great, thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak and thanks for organizing the event. Um, I'm really pleased to be able to discuss the confluence of three important issues, migration, the growing comp impact of climate change, and the dignity of individuals and their families. Uh, I work for the International Organization for Migration, the UN Migration Agency, and it's, it's our mission to support and promote safe and orderly migration with dignity in line with the Global Compact on Migration and the mandate of IOM. You know, and I, again, I just, I appreciate this, this session pulling together these three important and, and interconnected issues. Uh, I'd, I'd like to apologize in advance for the echo and if there's an internet disruption or issues with bandwidth. Um, I'm normally based in DC, but as Shannon mentioned, I'm now in the Tigray region of Northern Ethiopia as the UN responds to the current crisis here. I, I, just as an aside, there's a great need here and I'd request that you learn more about it and advocate for greater support and response to this very sad, and difficult situation. So IOM defines migration as the movement of persons away from their place of usual, usual residence, either across the international border or within a state. Migration can be voluntary or it can be forced. But let's unpack the word a little bit. Even for voluntary, it can make one think that this is an aspirational, positive decision being made. It's not clearly that black and white. A voluntary migration can occur due to an accumulation of overwhelming stresses in a degrading political or economic or social or climatic environment, rather than a more straightforward desire to better one's life and the life of, of one's family. A forced displacement is a bit more black and white. It's what we're seeing here in Tigray, with approximately 2 million IDPs and refugees who fled across the border. But migration can be irregular or regular. And we work with countries to establish protocols to offer alternative pathways to irregular migration. But this is challenging work. And in the instance of international migration, extremely sensitive work. Maintaining the monopoly over who crosses your border is a core component of sovereignty. Additionally, for the irregular or regular discussion, the status can change over time. A person can overstay a visa and go from regular to irregular. They can have a visa connected to an employer but leave that employer. So even that's not black and white. Migration can be one way or circular. Traditionally, when we think of labor migration, we think of one way migra migration from a developing economy to a more developed one. While that still happens, there's also growing numbers of people who wish to return home, people who just move regionally. And policy is slowly shifting to accommodate that. And climate change may change 
some of this, this policy formulation, then in part due to some of this very interesting research that has been done by Shanna and Aaron and Carl with, uh, with, with, with the framework, which I, which I was reading in advance of the panel. You, you had a section about the interviews with migrants from pre-Pacific countries that uh, now they're in the, the, the Midwest and, and Hawaii. And the primary reason for their migration was education, jobs, and families. Climate change was a secondary, tertiary, or may, maybe not even a, a reason mentioned at all. But once settled in the US, it was, I think the figure 80% indicated they don't intend to return. And they cited climate change as a primary reason. So that's interesting when we think about policy and how we're gonna frame things. We often think about how policy impacts drivers, but this wasn't a driver. This is something that once they've settled, they're, 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 they're having other issues, including the climate change issue, bubble up into their decision-making. And that moves it from academic to very, very real. Imagine an international labor migrant working overseas, earning good money, with a valid long-term work visa and access to services. You know, that would normally fall into the category of system working, congratulations, good job for all. Now imagine that anxiety contained within that same person, knowing that when she or he retires, the place they call home, the place they may prefer to return to is increasingly uninhabitable. And it's not a shock, it wasn't an earthquake, it wasn't a tsunami. This doesn't come as a surprise. Over the last years of them working, their remittance flows are less directed towards investment and more directed towards mitigation in place, a daunting battle. They worked hard, they followed all the rules, and they don't have a durable solution. Imagine a different scenario where a farmer's crops fail again, and all that remains for the family is debt. What are those rules? And does following them or not following them make a difference on the needs of that family? It's a tough one. You know, we're, we're back to a situation where the solution is just not black and white. You know, for example, what is a migrant and what is a refugee? There's an international legal definition for a refugee, but not one for a migrant. More and more, IOM and our sister agency, UNHCR, work on mixed flows of people. Some are economic or other types of migrants. Some are in need of protection. This is the case for numbers of people arriving at the U.S. southern border from Central America, South America, and across the globe. Those seeking to cross the treacherous Mediterranean Sea to arrive in Europe, originating from Sub-Saharan Africa, from the Middle East, from Central Asia. How many of them would describe climate change as the sole reason for their departure? I would assume very, very low. For how many is climate change a factor of a much more complex decision-making process that resulted in their decision to become mobile? Probably higher and much, much harder to unpack. You know, now here, the situation in Tigray is black and white. People are fleeing conflict. They're largely internally displaced and they're in dire need of services to sustain life and maintain an adequate level of dignity. Would it matter if climate change had a root cause in the conflict? Well, it, it wouldn't affect the type of immediate services required. Hungry people need food, thirsty people need water, people out in the elements need shelter, need health and psychosocial support, but it certainly could affect the durable solution for the Tigrayans currently displaced. Climate definitely has an impact on whether or not a solution is durable, and probably increasingly so over time, and currently, I would say, inadequately inserted into our decision-making process and our thinking when we try to find and work and listen to the people who are affected as they identify durable solutions for, for themselves. I remember almost 10 years ago, leading the IOM response in the Philippines after Typhoon Bopa. And there's a, a city that got really heavily damaged called Takuban, and no rebuild zones were created. 
the, the resettlement process uh, referenced by Susan, the plan relocation process that was set up because these areas were deemed unsafe for reconstruction. People couldn't restart their lives if they were from those areas. They were kind of stuck. They couldn't go back. They didn't have the resources to go somewhere else. And just to emphasize Susan's points about us really needing to drill down on, on this issue of uh, resettlement or relocation. I, I remember leading the, the response to the UN in Abaco after Hurricane Dorian back in 2019. Same thing. Uh, Carl brought up the issue of buying land in Fiji in his introduction. You know, it, the plan part about that is probably for citizens who had status and probably currently had land tenure and the government was doing the planning process that it should. In the Bahamas and the Philippines, the groups largely affected in these no rebuild zones were primarily irregular migrants. And how, does, how, how, how do we work through, through that? Definitely worthy of, of significant thinking. Well, IOM approaches the, the connection between climate change and migration three ways. We consider how climatic and environmental factors should be integrated into contemporary migration policy and practice. That cuts across labor migration, border management, return and reintegration, internal displacement, trafficking in persons, diaspora engagement. But how can they be integrated into migration policy? In the reverse, how can migration expertise be integrated across climate change and environmental agendas? And then the third is just the recognition that migration and climate change and its relevance to the broader policy and practice of disaster risk reduction, health, sustainable development, and, and humanitarian response and looking at, at mainstreaming. In 2007, member states asked IOM to work on migration, environment, and climate change. Then in 2008, we became engaged with the UNFCCC, Human mobility, as referenced by Susan already, so I won't really cover it, but it was brought up within the Cancun framework in 2010. Paris Agreement in 2015 went into greater detail, so slowly and incrementally, we are making some progress. Really, three key messages that, that, that I have about the linkage between climate change and migration. It's climate change is a factor in a cause of human mobility. Human mobility is one of the adaptation strategies to climate change. And that climate change policy must consider human mobility in all of the aspects uh, of, uh, of its planning and in its, in its design. In the pre-course cursor to the Global Compact on Migration is the, the New York Declaration. And there's 193 member states recognize the need for a comprehensive approach to human mobility, enhance cooperation at the global level to protect the safety, dignity, human rights, and fundamental freedoms of all migrants, irrespective of their migratory status. So we definitely have something to build on. I just wanna thank the, the organizers again to help putting a human face on this climate change debate by introducing and strengthening a discussion around dignity. More emphasis needs to be placed on the migrants themselves, their families, their communities, on understanding their strategies, the challenges they face, and the different mobility options that are available to them. So thank you again for the opportunity to talk. Over. Wonderful, Brian. Thank you so much. Um, now let's turn it over to Erin Daly. Um, to give some perspectives on dignity itself, but also in light of some of what's been discussed so far today. Erin, over to you. Hi, thank you, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, today's um, presentations, both the panel pre prior to this one and this one, I think have been really, really interesting and really sort of go well together in terms of helping us understand these kinds of issues. And I just want to say there couldn't be a better segue to what I wanted to talk about than the invitation that Brian ended his presentation with. Um, so that is exactly where I'll go. Um, let me just sort of set the stage a little bit. 
it seems to me that in this panel and sort of um, reinforced by the, the conversation in the prior panel, um, a few things are eminently clear if they weren't before. One is certainly that this whole issue is incredibly complex, right? We're talking about hundreds of millions of people moving around the globe in different ways. And we're trying to connect that to these climatic events that are gonna change the, the geology of the planet. Um, and you just couldn't have a more, uh, sort of a more polycentric set of issues that law is trying to deal with and trying to, trying to sort of manage in some way. The definitions that we deal with are complex and sort of ill-matched. The classifications that we're talking about, are people migrants, are they internally displaced? Is it about mobility more than migration, et cetera? All these questions are so, so difficult to manage. And I think sort of Susan's comments and Monica's comments especially were, were also very much sort of highlighted just the complexity of the questions that we need to ask. And so, um, and for years when we've been talking about climate change, environmental issues in general, but climate change in particular, um, human rights wasn't really a part of the environmental conversation. Human rights wasn't really a part of the climate change conversation. And still to this day, many of the climate change cases are not um, deploying human rights strategies. They're really about emissions. They're about limitations, um, adaptations in that sense and mitigations in that sense of climate change rather than um, understanding sort of the human rights impacts. Um, and so to bring human rights into the conversation is, I think, a really important step forward in terms of understanding how do we manage this? How do we, as sort of part of not just the international community, but the international legal community, developing laws and policies to deal with this, how do we deal with this? I think, I think the point that I would like to sort of make, um, and I'll explain it, but the point is simply that bringing human rights into this is a half a step forward but it's not the full step forward and bringing dignity into this brings us sort of the rest of the, of the way that we need to go. And again, a lot of what Brian said sort of presaged a lot of what I'm going to, what I'm going to talk about, sort of the problems that he posed. Um, I think in, in a lot of ways, dignity presents a solution for it. So we know beyond the shadow of a doubt that climate change is causing all kinds of impacts on the enjoyment of human rights. Um, among people who are not migrating, but also among people who are migrating. So it goes beyond the issue of migration and mobility and reaches everybody, but it certainly does reach the people who are migrating. Um, and as Monica said, it's been recognized that the greatest human rights threat that we've ever faced is in fact climate change. And we see this in all kinds of ways that some of you have mentioned that were mentioned in the previous panel, the impacts on life, the impacts on health, the impacts on food and water and employment and education um, and quality of life and uh, civil and political rights. All of those are impacted in various ways by climate change. Um, and as Susan sort of talked about, there's a lot of, um, to put it kindly, sort of there's a lot of gaps in the law right, about how to deal with this. The law is in some places completely absent. In other cases, it's there, but it's not really binding. It's a little soft. It's not really strong enough or countries haven't ad adhered to it. And in other ways, it's just completely fragmented and it's not really getting to the core solution. When we bring human rights into this, it is, as I said, a step forward because at least we're focusing on the people who are affected by these climatic changes. But human rights law was not made for climate change. And we saw this, we was sort of talked about this in the dignity and climate change conversation yesterday. And we see this in some ways in the presentations today. Human rights law, as we know it today, really comes from the post-World War II moment when the biggest threat to humanity was something like Nazism and the Holocaust. And so the, the response to that was to develop human rights with dignity as a way to protect humanity from those kinds of disasters, from those kinds of threats. Um, and human rights law is in a lot of ways much too narrow to deal with the kinds of threats that we're dealing with now. The fact that we're talking about rights puts us in this mindset where there are victims and perpetrators and victims go into court to vindicate their rights against perpetrators who have caused a violation of their rights, classic sort of rights sort of scenario. 
And yet when we're talking about climate change, it's not about whether it's human induced or not, or whether it's anthrop anthropocentric or not. The problem is that a lot of climate change isn't, the, the impacts of climate change on human rights isn't necessarily caused by one person, by a specific perpetrator, right? The, 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 um, the nature is much more complex than that. So what we have is that, um, and then we also have the sort of the central problem of human rights is actually something that we haven't really talked about, but the fact of state sovereignty, right? And the fact that states get to decide in the world that we live in now, states get to decide how much human rights they wanna pay attention to and how much they don't, what, they, what treaties they wanna to adhere to and what treaties they don't, and how much they wanna to adhere to them and how much they don't. So we have these real big sort of limitations of human rights. And the way human rights sort of is, is organized it's organized you know, from the UDHR on, but as specific threads, right? So you have this housing thread or social, social and economic threads and civil and political threads. And you can sort of pull them apart and say, oh, we're gonna litigate this particular issue or we're gonna focus on land issues or sanitation issues or whatever in terms of the effects of climate change on, on migrating uh, populations. You can pull them apart. Um, but you can see that the threats are sort of independent of one another, right? And that's, I think, in one way, in one, for one reason, why this notion of migration with dignity and the, and the policy, the conceptual and policy framework that Carl was presenting that, that we've been working on along with um, Yuka Hamada, Jenny May, and, and others, um, is really designed to provide not just a different approach in policymaking, but a conceptual framework for how we understand the relationship, the, the impact of climate change on human beings and on their decisions to move, to, to move from, from their place of residence. And what dignity does fundamentally is exactly what Brian was just sort of calling for. It puts the focus on the human beings. It takes the focus, it, it de-emphasizes the notion of rights in a sort of litigious sense, in, a sen in, the, in the sort of victim and perpetrator sense. And it focuses on the impact and the experience and the lives of human beings in all of their complexity. So it forces us to ask questions like, from whose perspective should we be looking at this problem? From the perspective of the government, what rights does the government owe people? Or from the perspective of the people, what do they need? What do people need when they're thinking about moving from one place to another, when they're exercising that agency, which really may not be a choice for them? Um, and for whose benefit are we developing laws and policies? So what dignity does is, and as Brian said, is sort of put a human face on this problem or hundreds of millions of human faces on this problem. What dignity can do is take those threads of human rights law and focus and, and help us see the fabric that those threads are actually making so that we're looking at really sort of the substance of it and not just the fragments of it. Dignity has um, a lot of uh, sort of um, attributes that make it particularly pertinent to this area of law. Um, first of all, it's deeply embedded in internal national human rights law and in the constitutional law of most nations. And both of those are important. It means that as an international matter, it's pretty much, I would argue, a matter of customary law. It's probably, I would argue, a matter of use cogens. Dignity is not something that a country can say, oh, but I have a really good reason for ignoring it, right? Dignity is embedded in human rights law. It is what human rights law is all about. We know that from the UDHR, we know that from all kinds of things. But it's not just an international norm, it's also law in, um, in countries around the world, right? In the constitutional law of countries around the world. So it is enforceable in a way that human rights law sometimes may or may not be. Um, it also has qualities that make it particularly sort of relevant to the experience of migration or mobility. Dignity, we know from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is universal. That's really, really important. It means that every person has it. You don't have to be a citizen. You don't have to have a government grant you certain rights. You just have to be born. And if you're born a member of the human family, you have dignity. 
and you have it in equal measure with every other person. So nobody has more or less dignity. It's not the folks who got to the country first who are citizens and make the laws that get to say, but we have more dignity than other people, every, than people who are coming in later. Everybody has equal dignity. It's inalienable. You keep it with you throughout your life. A government can't grant it and it can't take it away. It's inherent, it's inalienable. Because it's equal for everybody, it gets to, it's not the same thing as, a, a, as equality rights, but it gets to the notion of equality in a really important way, right? So if you're paying really close attention to dignity, there is no justification for discrimination. There is no justification for saying this group of folks gets these rights, but those groups of folks not so important, we're not sure if we like them, not so valuable to us, so they don't get these rights. Right? Dignity requires that everybody's equal worth gets respected. And that cuts through ethnic discrimination, religious discrimination, citizenship discrimination, gender discrimination, and all kinds of other things. Dignity also, as I mentioned before in sort of my fabric metaphor, but it unifies rights, right? So, so much of human rights discourse is about this particular right or that particular right as it impacts a, a, um, a population. But what dignity does is say, nobody's just losing their land, but keeping their housing and their sanitation and their employment. People are losing all kinds of things when climate change um, impacts them, right? And dignity sort of forces us to think about that human experience, to think about all the ways in which things are, in, uh, rights, but also needs are impacted um, by a particular, uh, either acute or less acute event. Dignity also, because it's part of an international um, human rights law and because even more importantly, because it's intrinsic to the human person, it transcends jurisdictional limits. Right, so part of the big challenge of climate change is that we can't figure out whether we should talk about it as a global phenomenon or as a local phenomenon. Why? Because it's actually both, right? And depending on the specific thing we're talking about, one may be more important than the other. But dignity transcends that requirement that we talk in terms of jurisdictional limits. It is an obligation that is owed to all people. And importantly, to get a little bit legal about this, dignity imposes on states, not just negative obligations, do no harm, don't discriminate, but also positive obligations, particularly as it respects people whose dignity, uh, people who um, are in vulnerable situations um, and who are more likely to have their dignity threatened. So under general principles of dignity, as it's understood really in the case law around the world and at the international and regional levels, states have affirmative obligations. They must take action to protect the dignity of vulnerable populations, which would include migrating or mobile populations, whether internal or external. So what dignity adds to sort of the conversation is it, is it helps us um, develop a framework for thinking about these issues from the perspective of the human beings and recognizing that whereas law can sort of take sides on things, it can prioritize one thing or another, but dignity doesn't allow that. Dignity requires that governments and other decision makers respect the equal human worth of every person at all times and in all places. Thank you. Leave it at that. Thank you very much, Erin. Um, yeah, I, I think just to feed um, off of what you said and what all of our panelists have said, I think by looking at everything through uh, the migration experience through a dignity lens, we are able, and all of us are looking at, right, different perspectives of the human experience. So how can we highlight each individual's experience and what needs to be done in order to facilitate their migration with dignity? And so, um, with that, um, I want to just thank all of you for your pre presentations, for your thoughts, your perspectives. Um, I think this has been a thrilling um, day so far, but um, let's turn now to the Q&A session. Um, I'm going to just ask one more time that any of our participants add questions um, for our panelists um, as they uh, as they have them. Um, but we do already have a few lined up, and some of them are 
are uh, contextually heavy. So I'll start with two, um, the first two that I read out, and then um, I'll leave it to you to decide um, if uh, who, who would like to answer. But the first, oh, we need to change to gallery view. Is that a thing that I do or to does the attendance, does uh, Sophie do this? I don't know how to change the gallery view, so I will just simply hope that this works out. <laughs> um, so essentially, um, an anonymous thank you uh, for changing. Um, so thanks for the interesting panel. Um, two questions that have been posed. One, what gaps might a framework for migration with dignity fill in international, regional, and domestic law? And two, how might it exist in the legal order, um, either via the UN declaration or resolution, regional instruments, or something else? I think that on one hand, um, you know, Carl um, or Aaron, you could talk about how you see this, but it might be also interesting to see how Brian, um, Monica, and Susan would see this both from the UN and then the academic or World Bank perspective. So um, I'll start there and turn it over to you. Um, I'll take a couple of uh, cracks at this. Uh, first, I would say that um, in terms of what gaps might it fill, uh, part of it is, I think a lot of it is simply thinking about the law differently. That a lot of these laws already exist, they're being used in different contexts, and thinking about migration through the lens of these laws. And it also provides a, a bit of a framework for doing so in terms of all these different provisions, you know, scattered all over the place, trying to collect them in one place. Um, I also think that to a certain extent, it both codifies or uh, collects existing law and it pushes the envelope in certain ways. And I think Susan hit on this uh, where yes, the, in terms of movement, there is the ability, there should be under law, the ability to leave your country, but you don't necessarily have a right to enter other countries. So in certain ways, the migration with dignity framework is simply collecting and codifying and providing framework of existing law. In other ways, it is pushing the envelope. Um, and so uh, to my mind, uh, I think there's, um, uh, the biggest gap is just taking all these other bodies of law and applying them in this context. And I think this goes to what the International Law Commission has done in terms of uh, fragmentation that so often people think very narrowly, migration, okay, what's the law of migration? And what we're trying to do here is to look more broadly across the bodies of law, to say what law is relevant here and applies in maybe ways that people aren't thinking about it. I'll, was there. Yeah, if, if I could uh, add into that a bit, um, and mostly on the second part of the question, um, I think that in my view, that we've had the most success in recent years in building a body of international law um, by starting with the non-binding frameworks, um, things like the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration. And I see that as a mechanism by which can begin to um, convince states that this is not only good, but it's in their interest. Um, I would think that if you wanted to go directly into a convention or even a declaration, um, the end result would be worse than what we have now, not better. As I don't think the confidence is there among states that they can give up any of their sense of sovereignty over this issue um, and trust cooperation with other states. Um, and so if we want to move towards a framework of migration and dignity, we need to take the steps now to build the confidence. Um, and best through the mechanisms that are already in place, like the Global Compact, um, where we can break through some of the resistance and develop um, more 
collegiality in effect among states, uh, not thinking of north-south divisions, um, destination origin divisions, but rather um, what makes sense in the framework for everyone. And I want to just apologize because I actually have to cut and run right now. Um, if anyone has a question specifically for me, please um, get in my email through one of the conference organizers. I'd be happy to answer. I've got a, a flight that's going to leave without me. So bye. Thank you so much, Susan. Happy travels. <laughs> Happy and safe travels. <laughs> um, are there any other thoughts on this question? I'll jump in real quickly um, with a thought, and it is sort of at a rather abstract level, but I don't mean it that way. Um, I think so much of law, including human rights law and certainly environmental law um, and the law that's developed so far around climate change permits a huge amount of human suffering. And when we're talking about these issues, we talk about huge numbers, all these rights that are affected. And, and it's, you know, those are each individual lives. Um, people who are struggling, people who basically just want a stable and safe place to live where they can raise their kids. And we have created a system um, that allows, that tolerates a huge amount of suffering in all kinds of ways. And I think that if dignity can contribute anything to it's to um, force us to accept less suffering and to try to create policies and programs and laws and all the things, all the tools that we use to make the world a better place um, to try to reduce that suffering, particularly among people who have the fewest resources on earth, which are the people that we're talking about. Thank you, Erin. Um, so the next question comes from Catherine, who mentions that we've heard about consultation with people affected and about education training um, and those likely to be affected by climate change migration. Um, she's interested in finding out where or how the voices of migrants are heard beyond the consultation process. Um, so are there examples where learning mechanisms, um, like how can we learn from the migrants and, and beyond just from a research perspective, how can we include their voice um, and get them uh, more involved in the process for defining and reshaping um, you know, these processes moving forward. Um, I think each of you have mentioned this in different ways. And so I'd be interested to hear, um, maybe Monica, you have some uh, examples of this. Yeah, so I, I think I was the, I think I overused probably the term consultation when there were better terms that I could have used for what I was talking about, which really, I mean, usually we would say participation and leadership of affected communities and really i mean you, the the phrase is nothing about us without us right the really we we want policy solutions to be led to be driven to be to have fully full buy-in from the the people that they are seeking to serve because otherwise they're they're just not going to work um and so, you know, I, th I think one of the things that really needs to happen is, as you read better research as to what, and uh, Brian mentioned this as well, is that we need to have a lot more conversations and do a lot more research that really is focused on speaking to people um, who are uh, in these situations and asking, you know, not just not just questions about what their experience is, but questions about what they want to see. Um, and we're, we're trying to do that a bit in our, in our research right now is to conduct a field-based research that really is asking people, you know, not just what have you experienced, what, how, um, how have your rights been affected, but really what, what, are the solutions that would work for you. Um, and I, I think that's a, a really important point. I want to, to thank Catherine for, for making it because you're right, it it's, can't just be consultation. Um, Brian, please. Great, thank you, Shanna. I mean, 
Like everyone on this opinion, or everyone on this panel has has lots of opinions, right? I, I have lots of opinions, uh, and it, it, it is strange, somehow counterintuitive, that when we start dealing with people, and people get categorized in self-sufficient or they're vulnerable, and all these adjectives get get thrown on, we 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 do get prescriptive on how how we feel like we can address the circumstances that they're in. Uh, but just because, just like I have a lot of opinions, I, the, the, the people who are affected by all the different issues of the world have those same opinions. And we're having conversations right now in Tigray that really gets down into the details about living in a camp or living with a host family? And what are the different requirements? What's acceptable? What's going to be dignified on a very, very practical level? Uh, and, and we need to do more of it. I, sometimes we get very focused on size, scale, and speed when we're addressing need, and we should, right? Because people are suffering. But to ever skip that step, in my experience of having messed up many, many things in my career, I just know that that's just delaying the resolution of problems because there are, there are issues that, that can be addressed by listening to people and engaging with them and hearing what their solutions are. Uh, so that's kind of on a very practical level it just makes sense for for the delivery. And I just want to touch on one one other kind of like uh, a side but important aspect to this these voices. A really important voice is the diaspora. You know, because the diaspora represents that extended family or social network that has already moved to a particular location. And there's a very big distinction between the diaspora and an aspiring migrant to arrive. Again, on a practical level, the diaspora, they're paying taxes, they're voting in local elections, they're voting in federal elections, and they have a very strong voice in the decision-making process. And so while, while we all on and should focus on those who are being directly impacted by the issue. These broader networks, some quite influential, are also very helpful in us figuring out how we can amplify their voice, which is already quite weighty. So thank you. Thank you, Brian. Um, so let's move now to the question from Patrick. Um, how much is implementing a successful migration with dignity process dependent on domestic political will? For example, populist resentment towards migration seems like, and perhaps always has been a ripe issue for far right parties who can increasingly double down on state sovereignty and on lifeboat ethics as the situation worsens. It seems likely that they will claim that there isn't enough like resources, land, money, et cetera, to go around. And so countries should respond to climate change in a nationalistic fashion. How important is addressing and shaping public awareness as a component of successful migration with dignity? Um, I actually like this question a lot because I also wondered, you know, in, in Carl's note about how that we were working with Pacific Islanders who don't cite climate change necessarily as a reason to move, but it's a reason why they don't move back. You know, it's not just, I think, inclusion of migrants in the in the decision making process beyond beyond the research, but it's also about how it will play a part in, you know, their education awareness of the context and then how it connects to awareness of successful migration with dignity through an implementation, implementation perspective. So um, the two questions here are to you, um, implement, how much is implementing a successful migration with dignity process dependent on political will? 
And then how important is addressing and shaping public awareness as a component of successful migration with dignity? Anyone would li like to take this? I, I, I can give a, a very short answer, which is that it's very, very important. Uh, you know, I, you know, we've said over and over again that you know we have a lot of the the protections and a lot of the laws already in place, but what's lacking is implementation. And part of why implementation is lacking is because of the lack of political will. And part of why lack of political will exists is because we have these harmful narratives about. Uh, you know, what migration means for communities, who deserves to migrate and move and who doesn't. Um, we have ideas like places are, as, as you mentioned, the, the idea that there isn't enough land or resources to go around, the idea that states are being overwhelmed. We use language like flows and waves and uh, you know, overwhelming, and all of the all of this language that creates a, a a sense that you know this is all too much that we can't handle it, and we need to close in um, and stop it. And so this is actually something that our office has been thinking about a lot. And I'm going to go ahead and paste in the chat here a link to some of the work that we've been doing about uh, building positive. Uh, narratives on migration because um, we're we're trying to find ways of working with communities in countries all around the world to really you know first of all bring migrants voices to the forefront but also you know, reshape the way that we talk and think about migration in order to to get at those questions that you identified Wonderful. Thank you very much, Monica. Um, so I guess um, I think uh, Monica just placed the link in the chat for more information. Um, we're two minutes away from the end of our session. And so, um, Bar well, let's see. Um, oh, Carl, um, there's a question on the release of the Migration with Dignity Framework. When will this happen? Would you like to speak a little bit about that, please? Um, I would love to. Uh, we are in the process of doing final edits, and i hoping that that will happen uh, in the coming couple of weeks at the latest. Uh, give people beach reading. And will they be able to find that'll be shared through our various networks, right, with both um, the Environmental Law Institute, um, uh, the Delaware Law School and the Dignity Rights International Project as well, likely. Uh, and, uh, but also through a variety of other networks of uh, ICM World Commission on Environmental Law, just the, you know, the, the various groups of people who work on these sorts of issues from, from a variety of perspectives. So we do want to make it widely available. And this is, um, this is meant to stimulate discussion. It's not meant as the final word. So we, we welcome feedback, um, uh, cons ideally constructive, um, and uh, um, look forward to continuing the discussion. And so on that point, I would say similar to Su Susan's comment earlier, um, if any of you are interested in learning more about what we've discussed today, please do reach out to us. Um, we can share our email addresses um, through the organizers. So um, we've made it to the end of the session. Um, it's been an incredibly stimulating conversation. I think I've learned quite a lot. I hope all of our attendees have as well. I wanna thank so much the each of our speakers for all of their perspectives um, and thoughts and times on this. And so please um, have a wonderful rest of your day and thank you again um, for joining us today. <laughs>